Hi, this is Sash. In this video tutorial, I'm going to show you how to build a binary search tree, or BST for short. I'm going to assume you know how binary search works. If not, take a look at my video on binary search analysis using comparison tree, part 1, which starts off by reviewing binary search. In fact, I'm going to start with the sorted array I presented there and show what an equivalent binary search tree looks like. Like the linked list, the BST is a linked structure with nodes, except that in a BST every node has two links, a left child link and a right child link. The middle entry in the array, 26, which would be the first to be examined in a binary search, becomes the root node of the BST. If the comparison with the middle entry fails, binary search would then move on to the left or right subarray. Both options are represented in the BST. The middle entry of the left subarray, 12, becomes the left child of the root. And the middle entry of the right subarray, 62, becomes the right child of the root. We can recursively build trees under 12 and 62. Taking 12 to be the root of the tree to be built for the left subarray, 11 becomes its left child and 17 its right child. On the other side, taking 62 to be the root of the right subarray, 38 becomes its left child and 69 its right child. Do you see how the nodes to the left of the root form another BST, as do the nodes to the right of the root? Continuing with building our BST, the left subtree of 12 is done. In the right subtree of 12, 17 will not have a left child, but it will have 19 as the right child. Similarly, each of 38 and 69 has a right child. 45 to the right of 38, and 83 to the right of 69. This finishes up the BST. The tree that we built here is identical in shape to the binary search comparison tree for this array. But the big difference, of course, is that the BST is a real tree with nodes and links that can be programmed, whereas the comparison tree is only a mathematical model for analysis. And now, suppose we wanted to search for 19 in this BST. We would start at the root and compare 19 against 26. Since 19 is not equal to 26, we would check next to see if it is less than or greater than 26. Since it's less, we go to the left subtree of 26, because we know that everything in the right subtree is greater than 26, so 19 can't possibly be there. In the left subtree of 26, we first encounter 12. Since 19 is neither equal nor less than 12, we go to the right. This takes the search to 17, where again, 19 is neither equal to nor less than 17, so after another right turn, we land on 19 and success. Let's look at another example. What if we search for 38? The sequence of comparisons and turns would look like this, ending in success again. On the other hand, if we were to search for 20, which is not in the BST, the sequence of comparisons and turns would lead us all the way to 19, at which point we would want to make a right turn, but can't because 19 does not have a right child. And so, failure. We have run out of candidates. The search process can be turned into code in a pretty straightforward manner. We start out by defining a class called BST node for each node of the BST. For now, let's just work with integer data in the nodes so the class looks like this. Let's write a method that takes the root of the BST as the parameter and the value to search for as a second parameter, called target here. The method is declared to return a reference to the node that holds the matching value, or null if there is no match for the target in the BST. In the method, we first declare a tracking pointer called PTR and set it to start at the root. Alternatively, we could use root itself as a tracking pointer. Since it's a local variable, it can be changed without affecting the root from the calling code. But for clarity, let's stick with PTR. Next, we start up a loop that will run as long as PTR is not null. In the loop, we first check if target is equal to PTR.data. If so, we have found the target and can stop the search. The easiest way to do this is to just return from the method, sending back the current position of PTR. Otherwise, we check if target is less than PTR.data. If true, we set PTR to PTR.left and make a left turn. 
Otherwise, we set PTR to PTR.write, which will make a right turn and continue with the next iteration of the loop. If the loop is exited after all iterations are done, it must be because PTR has gone to null, which means we went all the way down the tree along the search path and fell off the bottom without finding the target. So here we should return null. And that's it. OK, let's turn our attention to defining the BST structure. In a BST, if a node has a value x, then all values to the left are less than x, and all values to the right are more than x. This is true of every single node in the BST, not just the root, which means you can define a BST recursively as either empty or a root with a left sub-BST and a right sub-BST with values in the left BST less than that of the root and values in the right BST greater than that of the root. We can apply this recursive definition to the BST we just built. I'm going to simplify the BST graphic by dispensing with the node structure. So it's just the data and the arrows for left and right children. Okay, let's see how we can recursively unfold the BST. At the top level it's a root 26 and it's left and right subtrees, which are also BSTs. Applying the recursion to the left subtree gives us a root 12 with left and right sub BSTs. Applying the recursion to the left sub BST of 12 gives 11 for the root with left and right sub BSTs again. But both of these are empty, which is one of the possibilities in the recursive definition. That is, a BST can be empty. And this means the left and right child pointers of the node 11 will both be null. And we continue unwinding the recursion in all the other BSTs until they all dwindle down to empty BSTs. We can use this recursive definition of a BST to write a recursive version of our search method. Since in every recursive step only the root of a sub-BST is visible, the recursive code really just deals with the root. The parameter to the method is the root of the sub-BST that is being searched, which initially starts out at the root of the entire tree. In the method, we pretty much follow the recursive definition. The first part of the definition says the BST can be empty. In the code, this would correspond to the root being null. This happens if the initial tree itself is empty, that is, it does not have any nodes, which of course means the target was not found. Or, it happens when we recursively downsize BSTs until we get down to an empty BST, without finding a match for the target. In either case, since the target was not found, we return null. This is a base case or termination condition where the recursion cannot proceed any further. If the root is not null, we check the data in the root, comparing it against the target. If they match, we return the root reference. This is the other termination condition. We don't need to recurse any further down the tree. Otherwise, we check if the target is less than the root data, and if so, we search recursively in the left sub BST. The method is called recursively with root.left sent in for the root of the left sub BST, and whatever is returned from the recursive call is passed on as a result. And if the target is not less than the root data, a recursive call is made for the right sub BST. Okay, now that you have seen how to search in a BST and how to write both iterative and recursive code for it, let's take a look at some variations in the shape of the tree structure. The data that we used to build our sample tree came from a sorted array. The reason I did this was to show how binary search corresponds to searching in a BST. In practice, however, data to a BST comes one at a time in random sequence. You start with an empty BST, then add data items as they come. We will see how to actually add items in a BST in another video, but here, let's take a look at what possible shapes a BST can take for any given set of data items that are stored in it. Say there's a website that stores usernames in a BSD. Two users sign up, and depending on who is first and who is second, we can get two BSD shapes. 
In the first tree, John Doe signs up first, then Jane Doe, while the sequence is reversed in the second. Data in the BSD is arranged in ascending alphabetical order, which means Jane Doe is less than John Doe. With three usernames, these are the possible tree shapes depending on the sequence in which the signups occur. Looking at these shapes, you might already have an idea of how new items are inserted into a BSD and where they end up in the tree. In the next video, we will come up with the algorithm and code for insertion into a BSD. See you then.